So, uh, shall I start now? Okay. So, welcome everybody uh, to the uh, first colloquium of this meeting. So, uh, our speaker is Professor Guy Sharon Agarwal. He is joining from Texas. Uh, his time is now about 8.30 uh, morning. So, very good morning to Professor Agarwal. And uh, uh, so to introduce Professor Agarwal, uh, he is well known to Indian scientific community, not only to Indian scientific community, but he is internationally well known for his works on quantum optics and many related areas. But uh, for the students, I will uh, say a few words to introduce Professor Agarwal. Professor Agarwal is currently at Texas A&M University with affiliations to the departments of physics and astronomy, biological and agricultural engineering, and the Institute for Quantum Science and Engineering. So earlier he served as the Nobel Foundation Chair and Regents Professor at the Oklahoma State University. He received his MS from BHU, that is Banaras Hindu University in 1966, PhD from University of Rochester in 1969. So before moving to the US in 2006, he spent about three decades in India and he trained many Indian students and mentored and many of whom are now faculty members in various institutes in India. And he has inspired many students around the world in quantum optics. And he received many awards and recognition. If I, uh, uh, if I list all of them, it will take quite a few times, few minutes. So I would name a few of them. He received Max Born Award in 1988. Einstein Medal of the Optical and Quantum Electronics in 1994. He became fellow of the Royal Society UK in 2008. Very recently in 2022, he received Charles Hard Dowens Medal of Optica, which is uh, formerly known as Optical Society of America. He wrote uh, many books and monographs on quantum optics, his monograph on uh, master on statistical theories of spontaneous emission in 1974 is a classic and uh, cited all over the world. And he very, very recently in 2013, he wrote book uh, quantum optics uh, by uh, published by Cambridge University and my students widely used this uh, book. And uh, today he will be talking about uh, his title of the talk is Quantum Metrology from Theoretical Perspectives to Experiments. So before I invite him, so I must say that I had the privilege to work with him for several years and we have connections and uh, I really learned a lot of uh, things about quantum optics from him. So with this uh, brief introduction, I invite him to present his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Bignendo. So a very good evening to all of you. I hope you all had your dinner, otherwise you would be very much delayed for your dinner. <laughs> so let me start sharing the screen. Okay, so I'm going to introduce to you the subject of quantum metrology. And in the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you 
the theoretical ideas. <clears throat> and then in the second part of the talk, I would like to describe some experimental work. So let me start with the, with the classic problem. When you want to sense the properties of the medium, a very standard method is to use light, send the light through the medium and look at the transmission from the medium. You can also look at the scattering from the medium and by studying, for example, the transmission from the medium as a function of the wavelength of the incident light, you learn a lot about the properties of the, of the medium. So in most experiments, uh, you look at the intensity of the transmitted light. Although there are experiments where you can also look at the phase of the transmitted light. So you can study both the intensity of the transmitted light and the phase of the transmitted light as a function of the wavelength of the incident light. And as I said, that this provides a wealth of information about the medium. Simplest would be the density of particles of the medium, various electromagnetic transitions allowed in the medium, oscillator strengths of the transitions, relaxation parameters, etc. If you have defects in the medium, then the defects are better studied by looking at the scattering from the, from the medium. And therefore the scattering becomes a sensor of the, of the defects in the in the medium. And the small perturbations on the medium are of a special interest. And one always asks the question, how small phase changes are, what is the, what can, I mean, can you detect very big absorption inside the medium? There are various other versions of these kind of, kind of sensors and uh, some of them are based on, on plasmonics, nanoparticles. The others are based on electromagnetic induced transparency. But the key idea is very similar, that you send light through the medium and you look at the characteristics of the transmitted light. Okay. Now the question is that, that what are the limits to our classical measurements? And some of these limits are set the way you do the detections. And typically you are making the intensity measurements, which are, which are measured by the, by the photo detectors. And therefore the photo detectors basically look at the number of photons in the transmitted field. We also know that an ideal laser does have fluctuations and these fluctuations are of quantum origin. For example, the, the photon numbers have Poisson distribution and these fluctuations would be reflected in the measurements of the intensity, intensity distributions. These are the fluctuations which also define the, what is called the short noise limit. <clears throat> And uh, keep in mind that the short noise limit can be reached only if all other sources of noise are, are removed. So the question that we, we, we are going to look into that can be beat the, the short noise limit. And that's where the quantum light enters in the picture. So just to say mathematically, what is the what is the short noise short noise limit? So you are sending a coherent field which has the Poissonian fluctuations through the medium, and you are looking at the transmitted signal. So you look at the intensity of the transmitted signal, 
and you look at the fluctuations in the in the transmitted signal. So the fluctuations in the transmitted signal go as a square root of the signal because of the coherent input to the to the medium. And therefore, if you look at the signal to noise ratio, the signal to noise ratio will go as a square root of S which is called the, called the short noise limit. If you want to do better than the short noise limit, then you have to replace the coherent light with quantum light. <clears throat> okay, so let me also remind you some of these, uh, these well-known uh, well results that suppose you do the interferometry with coherent sources, so what I have here is a, is a Mach Gander interferometer, and you put it put the coherent input here, and you are making a measurement of the phase. So you have some medium here. Let us say you have a dispersive medium here, and the dispersive medium imparts a phase change to the to the incoming light. And, <clears throat> and the question is that what is the short noise limit for such a phase measurement? And you can show that the short noise limit for the phase measurement goes as one over the square root of the photon number in the beam. So if you want to do better, we need to replace this coherent light with quantum light. There are many different kinds of quantum light and uh, one, one of the quantum lights is called the, called the squeeze light. <clears throat> so, so let's first look at the coherent light. So I have displayed here the, the fluctuations in the two quadratures of the field X and Y are the quadratures of the field. So this is a phase space representation of the coherent light. So coherent light has a mean amplitude. So at the center of this circle, you have the mean amplitude, this point, that represents the mean amplitude of the two quadratures. And the size of this circle, that tells you something about the fluctuations in the quadrature X and the quadrature y. You can think of the quadratures x and y as the real and imaginary parts of the complex amplitude of the light field. So the quantum fluctuations associated with these quadratures are given by this. These are in scaled units. So now what I have displayed here is two different kinds of squeeze light. One, where the amplitude quadrature is squeezed. So this circle is replaced by this ellipse. And you can see in this direction, the fluctuations are reduced. In the other case, in this direction, the fluctuations are, are reduced. So this one is the, is the example of the amplitude squeezed light. And this one is the example of the, of the phase squeezed light. So that's one possibility. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> many years ago, Carl Case came up with the idea that if you if you have the Mach gender interferometer and the port which was open here on the open port, you apply the squeezed vacuum. So squeezed vacuum. would be this, except that it's now placed at zero. The center is at zero. That is the squished vacuum. And uh, so you see, in the absence of this squished vacuum, we say that, that there is a vacuum noise which is entering this port. And because the vacuum noise is entering this port, that gives you the 
<clears throat> the fluctuations in the measured phase value. Now you replace the vacuum fluctuations by the squeezed fluctuations. So the squeezed fluctuations are lower than what it is in the, in the vacuum. If I go back to this, these would be the fluctuations in the vacuum of the field, whereas this would be the fluctuation in the squeezed vacuum. So we replace the vacuum by the squeezed vacuum. And then he found that this delta phi at this structure, this R parameter is the one which characterizes this squeezed vacuum. And uh, we say the squeezing in the field, which experimentalists like to quote in dV, is given by this expression in terms of this R parameter. So if you have 3 dB squeezing, which is fairly standard now to produce 3 dB squeezing, then the R parameter would be this, and the short noise limit or the standard quantum limit will be beaten by this factor root 2. OK, so let's look at, a, look at another example. So that was the that was the phase measurement, and now let's look at the absorption measurement. So we have a quantum field, let's say entering the medium, which has absorption alpha, and this is the output quantum field. So what we can look at, we can look at the fluctuations in the output quantum field, number fluctuations in the output field and try to relate the number fluctuations in the output field to the number fluctuations in the input field. And uh, <clears throat> experimentalists like to use this parameter, which is called the sensitivity parameter. And this is in terms of the noise, the quantum noise in the number fluctuations of the output field divided by the derivative of the signal with respect to this parameter of the medium. And in very general terms, you can show that this can be written in this form. So this is the input mean number of the photons. And these are the fluctuations in the input photon number. So from this expression, which is fairly general expression, you can see that this delta alpha is going to be minimum if this term is zero. And so this would imply that if you have an input field with a fixed number of photons, then this fluctuation term will be zero. So this immediately suggests that the, that the ideal input field for the measurement of the absorption, for the best, best possible measurement of the absorption, would be a field in the photon number state, or what's called the called the Fock state of the field. That will be best for the measurement of the absorption. And <clears throat> of course, needless to say that. Uh, the, that you know, over the last decade or so, particularly, a lot of effort has gone into development of the of the single photon sources of light. But the single photon sources are not yet very widely available. All right. So now I, you know, having introduced to you what the what the problem is, I like to describe to you. The, the formal theoretical work on the parameter estimation in classical and quantum physics. So, so what, is, what is the problem? I know we, we, have, uh, we have a system, we prepare the initial field, which you use as a probe to, to probe the properties of the system in some state. And the system will interact with this probe field 
and therefore the probe field is going to evolve into some final state. And you would make a measurement on the final state, and from the measurement, you would estimate the parameters. So that is the that is the standard standard parameter estimation problem, which is applicable to both classical and quantum physics. <clears throat> And the important questions here will be that, that what is the best initial state of the probe and what is the best measurement procedure. So at classical level, we have these well-known results from the work of uh, Kramer and Rao. <clears throat> And this is called the kramer rao bound for unbiased estimation. So X is a parameter which you are trying to estimate. Delta X is the uncertainty in the estimated value. N is the number of measurements. And FX is the Fisher information and this Fisher information is related to the probability of getting a measurement xj. So you get a measurement x value xj. This is the probability of getting the measurement value xj. And you compute this quantity, which is called the, the Fisher information. <clears throat> So, so now you see in principle from the from the from the measured probabilities you can in principle get the value of fx and once you have fx from that you can get this uh, kramer rao bound for the estimation of the of the parameter for continuous measurements the discrete sum is replaced by the integral So now we look at the look at the quantum Fisher information, and uh, in quantum Fisher information, we work of course with the with the density matrix of the system, and we introduce this this quantity. So the expectation value of this measurement operator and uh, you define then the Fisher information. This is the quantum Fisher information where the classical probabilities are replaced by these kind of quantum probabilities. And the quantum Fisher information is then obtained by maximizing this over all possible measurements. It sounds too complicated, but uh, but I, you know all this can be shown lead to some simpler results. This is another theoretical quantity which is introduced in the literature. So this is called Burris fidelity. You have two density matrices, row two and row one, and you are trying to figure out essentially what is the distance between the two two density matrices, row one and row two. And uh, so if you look at the density matrix for a measured value X and the density matrix for a measured value X plus delta X, then this distance can be expressed in this form. And this quantity gives you the, the quantum Fisher information. Okay, so, so now the next question is, uh, is, is there a simpler way to get this quantum Fisher information? And it depends on the evolution, on the nature of evolution of the system. So if, if you have unitary evolution of the system, like in the Mach gender interferometer, where you are measuring the phase, you have unitary evolution of the system. 
for absorption measurement you, you don't have the unitary evolution of the system that's the problem for the open system so for the unitary evolution of the system the quantum visual information has been shown to be given by this simple expression so you introduce this operator g and look at the fluctuation in this operator g evaluated in the input probe state so zero refers to the to the input state and this quantum operator g is defined in terms of the unitary evolution itself so in principle these are not uh, not easy to calculate because uh, unitary uh, unitary evolution itself is difficult to calculate but this one operator is to be computed from the unitary evolution and its derivative and the products and then the fluctuations in the input input field <clears throat> however if u has this form where theta is independent of the parameter x then this quantity g is just the evolution corresponding to generator of x and then if you put it in this equation then you find that this estimate the you know kramer rao bound reduces to this very simple and transparent form where this quantity is the fluctuation of this operator theta in the input state so if x were position or displacement then theta would be the corresponding momentum in appropriate scaled units and so this this quantity would uh, i mean this kramer rao bound would reduce to this form delta x delta p greater than or equal to 1 over 2 square root of n so so these are the these are now the measurement uncertainties all right so so i will i will now describe to you some some, <clears throat> some applications of these of these ideas and uh, later i will return to the case of open systems so some time ago i came across uh, this uh, this wonderful experiment uh, from uh, nist boulder and uh, this is quantum amplification of mechanical oscillator motion so what they were interested they were interested in measuring the the amplitude of the center of mass motion of trapped ions so that's what is the is the mechanical oscillator motion a trapped ion has the electronic degree of freedom as well as the mechanical degree of freedom and the mechanical degree of freedom are associated with the motion of the ion and they were interested in looking at the at the measurements of the motional degree of freedom or the displacement of the ionic oscillator and uh, typically these displacements are small and uh, what uh, what this group uh, figured out that uh, you can amplify the displacement of the the displacement associated with the ionic motion and once you amplify <clears throat> then you can you can measure it to much better accuracy so so that's what they are saying 
that we demonstrate a technique for amplifying coherent displacements of a mechanical oscillator with initial magnitudes well below zero point fluctuations. So remember the zero point fluctuations will correspond that when I discuss the quadratures, I said for coherent state delta x equal to delta p equal to unity in normalized units. And so what they are saying that uh, they have now a technique where they can measure the displacements which are well below the zero point fluctuations. So no classical technique would enable you to measure such a measurement, such a displacement, because those values are buried in the quantum noise. Now they are saying that when applying two orthogonal squeezing interactions, <clears throat> the displacement is amplified ideally with no added quantum noise so this is a this is a this is of critical importance that you amplify the displacement but do not add any quantum noise so this is extremely important and what they say that we implemented this protocol the trapped ion mechanical oscillator and determined an increase by a factor of about 7.5 in the sensitivity to small displacement. So I like to tell you what the what the little bit in detail about this experiment. Uh, uh, and uh, I think since uh, your workshop is uh, is also discussing a lot of stuff on trapped ions, and then tell you the quantum Fisher information perspective of this experiment. Okay, so what is the key idea that they have used? So they start <clears throat> with the mechanical oscillator in the, in the ground state. So that's the lowest state of the harmonic oscillator. And these are the zero point fluctuations associated with the, with the ground state. And what they said in the abstract that they want to measure a displacement, which is, which is much smaller than the size of this circle. Okay. So the idea is that you now squeeze this mechanical motion. You squeeze the ground state. Okay. So you, you would apply a squeezing operator. Okay. One has to have an implementation, experimental implementation of this. Once you apply this, you change it to this form. And then you displace the ion. When you displace this ion, so you get to this. But you see this displacement in the experiment is smaller than this size. You displace little bit. And then you do the anti-squeezing operation. And when you do the anti-squeezing operation, finally you, you come to this. So you had little bit displacement alpha i. And now this little alpha i has actually effectively become this. So mathematically you can show so these are, the math these are the various mathematical operations. You start with the ground state of the oscillator, squeezing, displacement, anti-squeezing, this part. And you carry out these operations. Then you find that you get final state, alpha f. And the final amplitude, this parameter g times initial amplitude. And G is the quantum amplification, which is produced by these two squeezing and the anti-squeezing operation. Please note that, that in this process, a coherent state has gone to a coherent state. So that was the statement in the abstract that no noise is added. 
You see this? These are the same size as this. So you have amplified the displacement, but without adding any, any additional noise. <clears throat> Okay. Well, you must have already seen uh, some, de you know, details of the trapped ion, how things are done. So, so this is for the magnesium, <clears throat> magnesium ion, and uh, this is the ground state. Zero is the mechanical oscillator or the ionic motion ground state. Up and down are the two hyperfine states. So this is down, down. This is up, and, and these are the ionic states ionic states mm -hmm. and all the operations <clears throat> in these kind of problems are done by using Raman pulses. So you use these two Raman pulses and you can make various kinds of transition. You can make transition from one of these to one of these, from here to here, or you can make transitions without going there. That's from here to here, here to here and so on <laughs> by choosing the frequencies of the pulses. Okay, so, so they apply what's called a red sideband pulse on two ground state hyperfine levels, followed by resonant pi by two microwave pulse with phase phi. And finally, they want to monitor the population in this state. In, so in this hyperfine state. And the population is monitored by applying another field and then looking at the fluorescence. So that's the monitor of the population in this, in this state. Calculation shows that the probability of finding the ion in the lower state is this, where this quantity C is a measure of the contrast. So you study this as a function of phi, so it's like interference fringes, <clears throat> and C would be a contrast. <coughs> which would be this, this quantity. And phi, this was the microwave pulse with phage phi. And signal to noise ratio, you can compute signal to noise ratio. So that turns out to be this quantity where C is the contrast. Okay, and, and they were interested in the experiment only for a small values of alpha i. <clears throat> so if alpha i is small and this amplification parameter is small, then this product is small. And in that case, you can show that this contrast parameter is just this. So if you see the contrast parameter, the contrast is now amplified by this factor G. And therefore, you can have much better <clears throat> estimate of the displacement because of this quantum amplification, which was achieved by applying the squeezing and the anti-squeezing operations. Okay, so this is, I mean, they did this experiment, beautiful experiment with beautiful results. Uh, but uh, we asked the question that is this is this measurement optimal? And uh, this can only be answered 
by consideration of uh, quantum fissile information. So let me now describe to you some of the theoretical results uh, which we developed uh, the, the, the QFI framework for this experiment. And uh, so what we are doing here, we start with the ground state of the ionic motion. We applied this S and then we applied this displacement, then anti-squeezing or S dagger operator, and then a readout. But now if you look at this, what have, what have we done? This is what you are trying to probe. So the so this one is seeing this field. In other words, the probing field is the squeezed vacuum because we applied this squeezing operation here. And so by using the QFI framework, I can look at what is the corresponding operator that I need to consider for calculating the quantum fissure information. The, uni the analog of the unitary evolution is just the displacement. This is well known that any displacement is represented by this unitary operator. And therefore, this is the operator for which I need to compute the fluctuations to calculate the quantum fissure information. So quantum fissure information, initial probe, which is a squeezed state, fluctuations in this operator, which is just this. And so you can compute all that and you find that the quantum fissure information is just this factor. So see what I say, this is very nice because it shows that the quantum fissure information is now amplified by this factor G square. And therefore, kramer rao bound would become better by this factor G. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, let's see what is the what is the measured quantum fissure information. So fissure information corresponding to the to the measurement in the experiment of uh, Boulder group. Okay, so the measured information which you would get in terms of the contrast. So you look at this quantity, you are looking at the interference fringes, look at the probability for getting the maximum, probability for getting the minimum, and this would be the measured fissure information. Whereas quantum fissure information is this. So this is the quantum fissure information. This would be the one which would be measured in the experiment. So we can compare the measured fissure information and this quantum fissure information. So the measured one is plotted here as a function of this amplification parameter for different values of the displacement. If the displacement is very small, then you have this black line, which is the same result as the quantum fissure information. When the displacement becomes larger, say 0 0.05, at larger values of G, the differences arise between the measured and the and the quantum fissure information. So, <clears throat> so this already suggests that uh, that this the, the experiment of Bird et al. that is the best measurement if the displacement is small 
but when the displacement starts becoming larger then this is not an ideal measurement so again it has to be remembered that the quantum fisher information it tells you what what the best possible measurement could i mean best possible bound could be but it does not tell you what experiment i must do to get the best possible bound and so you you always need to figure out what would be the best measurement and uh, so in this case it turns out that the best measurement would be a phonon counting measurement so that's not a photon counting that is the that is the phonon counting in the sense you have the ionic motion and the, and if you can figure out the the distribution of the ion in different uh, ionic levels so that would give you the the, the phonon counting distribution and uh, this phonon counting distribution if you use so this is the classical fisher information it coincides with the with the quantum fisher information okay so theoretically we know that uh, that if this this measurement can be implemented then we will get the classical measured fisher information to be same as the quantum fisher information and then we will have the optimum measurement so we have uh, we applied this to to many many different systems and uh, this is, so these are other other interferometers and uh, so this is the phase measurement by by atomic interferometry and a general feature which i like to point out is the following so this applies to all the interferometers that this part is the initial preparation of the probe <clears throat> this box that is the interferometer interferometer is always represented by a unitary operation and you know in bird at all's experiment that anti squeezing operator was applied and then readout was there so this part is really the detection part the detection strategy this is the initial preparation strategy interferometer and this part is the is the part of the detection strategy and uh, so we looked at this uh, this atomic interferometer and so what you do you have the uh, now the the spin states the the collective states you make so you start everything in the ground state and you apply this measurement uh, i mean this uh, preparation operator so this one actually what it does it prepares a multi particle gg state which is an entangled state so the probe is now in entangled state consisting of multiple multiple particles then you have interferometer and then you apply this nt of this so you see a minus sign there and some d out so as indicated here that this part gives you this multi particle entangled state this is the generator of rotations and then you compute the quantum fisher information based on this part this is the probe and the quantum fisher information is just this factor so delta phi is 1 over n so this is called the heisenberg limited measurement the standard short noise limited measurement has the square root of n but in the heisenberg limited measurement you have n here and uh, this measurement strategy gives you 
a measured fissure information which is identical to this this one and so it shows that this is the best strategy okay so so i i now like to tell you a little bit about the about the two mode squeeze light and uh, in case of two mode squeeze light the the quantum mechanical state of the light is given by this so you have n photons in mode 1 n photons in the mode 2 these could be two polarization modes or uh, these could be two two different uh, modes I even mean, they could even have two different uh, frequencies or two different propagation directions so various various possibilities are there and what it means that uh, if you find one photon going this way then there is another photon going this way so these are the two modes or you find two photons going together here two photons going together here and such a state has a strong quantum mechanical correlations and so this is another interferometer and uh, which is uh, used quite a bit nowadays it is called mathematical name su11 interferometer because this is connected with this kind of transformation so these are the two modes and this is the squeezing transformation for two modes so what one does in this interferometer you have you have two modes so this is this is starting is the vacuum modes and you have this squeezing operation so you produce two mode squeeze light here and one of these is sent to the phase measurement and then the detection part so after this dashed line you have the detection part you apply the nt of this and then read the readout and you can use various types of readout you can use for example photon numbers here photon numbers here add them up and look at the fluctuations in this in this addition so for this strategy you look at the quantum fissure information and this is the initial state which is two mode squeezed state you look at the fluctuations associated with the conjugate variable conjugate variable associated with phi is the number variable so you look at the fluctuations and from that you can get the error sensitivity delta phi <clears throat> and this delta phi goes as 1 over n so n is the number of photons associated with this input input probe which is this and the quantum fissure information also gives you the same value and therefore this is the this is the best measurement strategy even for this interferometer let me stop for a minute here so bimlendu bimlendu yes yes i can hear you oh. yeah I, uh, you know since you bimlendu yes yes yeah i was going to say that since uh, you know i went over the material very slowly <laughs> oh, it's so, fine eh yeah, so uh i will have to i will have to cut out some parts you know uh, but i just wanted to communicate the key ideas you know on the, on the quantum metrology so okay then let me continue would you like to take any question at this time 
Yeah, why not I, I take some questions at this, at this point? Because uh, I'm now going to discuss something about the open systems. There are many students here. Is yeah, there certainly. Students? I mean, uh, so if you have any question, uh, you may ask. Just a query. Uh, when in '89, when I was at Imperial, Peter Knight used to work on this thing. He used to call them. He was very excited about this thing. That uh, no, can you? Can, I can't hear you that well. Can you is, speak louder? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, actually, in 89, uh, Peter Knight, we used to work on this thing, he used to call it bright squeezing. So that means what you are talking about, first you squeezing operator, then this displacement operator, without the S-dagger operation. And he used to, he was very excited about this thing. You are referring to the same kind of uh, bright squeezing what uh, Peter used to talk about, right? No, it's not the bright squeezing. Bright squeezing would be one where the, the displacement is extremely large. Yes. Yes. Whereas, whereas here, here displacement is something that we want to measure, and displacement in those normalized units is much smaller than one. Yeah. So, so bright, bright squeezing would be one where displacement alpha would be hundreds of thousands. Oh, <laughs> in I those see. Unit. But he never had this uh, S dagger operation on that. Okay, he was talking about this squeezing and moving it from the origin to some other point. The, no, the no, that you. No, no, that you can do, but uh, here the here the ideas, uh, you know, I mean the uh, the the experiment that uh, that uh, the Boulder Group did, it's a it's a very clever experiment, and uh, I was involved in SU11 interferometer and all that, and they had similar strategy, but uh, I did not realize this perspective that they came up with. You know, amplifying the displacement and then that makes the measurement so easy. It's truly remarkable. Yeah, truly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, now we just looked at the, you know, more formal perspective of their experiment and the question whether that's the best possible experiment. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Parameter this alpha small displacement. Yeah. How small is small? I mean, uh, is there any bound, uh, uh, any criteria for uh, determining the smallness? Well, as I said, that in those school scaled units, quantum fluctuations are of the order of one, and and so the alpha which you are taking is like, uh, you know, one over one over hundred or less. But, uh, but if alpha becomes too small, then you need larger amplification, larger squeezing parameter. And the, and the best value that, uh, that the Vinelands group got for the amplification factor is about 10. That is the best value. Now that itself is very large because you know squeezing parameter, if you think R equal to one or two, is actually very large squeezing parameter. R equal to one corresponds to nine dB of squeezing, you know. So, so that's fairly large squeezing, you know. So practically, there would be practical difficulty to produce uh, larger, larger G value. And that's what would set a limit on how small alpha you can have. The question. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I am a little confused with your uh, the calculation of the uh, classical Fisher information and the quantum Fisher information matching for phonon counting. Yeah, because uh, just the scheme you said, like if the anti-squeezing operator I put as part of my measurement, then it seems like 
like it's kind of an becomes an impossible measurement right because uh, my my displacement is along a along a quadrature axis so i need to be face sensitive and i'm doing a cw quadrature squeezing part along with photon phonon count counting so i need to count as well as be face sensitive isn't that no no face no no let me just go back okay let me stop here yeah so you see what what we are saying that zero then you squeeze it r and then you have the alpha and try at this so this is the probe and after this is your detection and mechanic and yes. so for this part in binary case is s inverse and then the the ground state probability for phonon counting measurement this detection part would be your phonon counter whatever it is yeah but uh, that is the thing right? if i do not do the anti squeezing i do not get the amplification right which one if i in yeah, my yeah. if i am not so, face sensitive so, uh, quadrature detection i do no, not no here, no here you i, I forgot so so this alpha once you have gotten g alpha then you do this photon phonon counting okay uh -huh. but that still needs to be face sensitive to measure the displacement right which is along a one quadrature right no no so that's how you you apply you see uh, see in that uh, because uh, uh, you know you don't want to add uh, no noise in this process okay okay so that can only be done this this s is applied whatever axis you apply this s on and the phase, all the phases have to be chosen properly okay the phase of this and the phase of this okay uh -huh. yeah. so that so that is a noiseless amplification Okay. 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 Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I have a question that the ion can be displaced displaced in uh, x axis or y axis in any way. So uh, in both case, we can measure the displacement, right? Yeah. So first, you decide how you want to display displace the ion. Once you have decided how you want to displace the ion. then uh, you apply those the squeezing operations so the displacement of the ion is also decided by what kind of raman pulses you apply the phase the phase of those raman pulses that decides the displacement direction okay so then uh, we apply the amplitude quadrature quiz and phase quadrature Because I mean, for two cases, we have to apply two ways of squeezing. No, you see, you you let me go and and show you that slide.
work. I am not been able to go. I have, to, I have to remove something. It keeps me going, going back to this slide. Okay, can you can you see this uh, this slide? It's not in this slide. Slide presentation mode. Where the zero SR D alpha, all those things are there. Yeah, yeah, we can see them. Yeah. Okay, so you see, I mean, this uh, there is always a direction associated with this because uh, when I wrote down this one, it assumes this way squeezing. So you know, if you see this uh, this graph here, alpha is taken in this direction, and this S is also squeezed in this direction. So once you decide that which, uh, which, which is the direction of your displacement, you need to choose the direction of this accordingly. In order to produce the amplification without noise. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, open quantum systems, and uh, in the beginning I was discussing the measurement of the absorption. So, so for that we need a different framework. Uh, we need to work with the with the master equation framework, and in that case, uh, one introduces. So suppose you have solved the master equation for the density matrix, X is a parameter for which you want to estimate, then you define what's called symmetric logarithmic derivative, this L of X. And if you can compute this quantity L of X, then the quantum Fisher information is given by this expression. So that's for the open system and uh, the difficulties are associated first with finding the full density matrix for the open system and then finding this symmetric logarithmic derivative. And these are all operator quantities. Things become easier if rho happens to be diagonal. But in principle, this is the formulation for computing the quantum Fisher information for an open system. And once you have this, then you can uh, use this in the kramer rao bound to get the bound for the parameter x. So this is a this is a simple master equation which describes the propagation of a of a single mode field through a medium which has absorption so some decay of the field by the medium and medium is at some temperature t and you can find out what is the output density matrix. So by looking at the output density matrix, suppose the medium is at zero temperature. So you can drop this term N of T. Then you can look at the this output density matrix and using the formulation of the previous slide, you can compute 
the quantum fissure information and the best possible measurement param i mean estimate of the of the absorption parameter and it turns out that the best possible measurement is when you use input fields in the photon number states are like single photon states that would give you the best possible measurement of the absorption parameter as i had indicated in the in the very beginning now in recent time there are also a lot of papers on uh, what people call quantum thermometry and so they also look at the the best possible temperature measurement what is the quantum state which gives you the best possible temperature measurement <clears throat> so that also you can study because again it's a it's a open system problem you find out the output density matrix now you solve something little more difficult look at the output density matrix and compute the quantum fissure information and from that you can find out the estimate of the temperature parameter and this gets related to this temperature parameter and this quantity eta which is related to this absorption parameter or damping parameter in the in the medium in the steady state this would be the result and this would be the result for the fissure information quantum fissure information associated with the temperature variable so we have more general results for these things and uh, okay so i i'll take another 5 minutes is that okay just to tell you two key results not any details Hello, Vimlendu. Are you okay? Another five minutes, if I take. So yes, it's all right. Yes. Okay. So, uh, well, I wanted to describe this another set of measurements more in detail, but since time has run out, I would only say that uh, that we have done measurements of the absorption parameter, quantum, using quantum light, and which is the two mode squeeze light. with an input seed so so this is a two mode input light with a with the input probe seed and so this is this would correspond to to two mode bright squeezed beam okay so that's what we use and uh, in the case of two mode squeezed light with input probe seed these are the generated uh, probe and the conjugate fields and the physical process which is being used is the four way mixing process this is the four way mixing process in rubidium vapor <clears throat> and uh, what's important is the in this case we look at the intensity difference intensity of this field intensity of this field difference of the two intensity and the fluctuations in the intensity difference the fluctuations in the intensity difference have the squeezing characteristics they are of quantum origin and those fluctuations are used for <coughs> measurement so i'll just skip all that uh, so see what what you see here this quantity is the fluctuations in the number difference of the two output beams compared with the fluctuations in the number difference of two coherent beams so that's the measurement of the intensity difference squeezing this is intensity difference squeezing and so that's how theoretically this looks like as a function of the gain of the of the four way mixing 
amplifier <clears throat> and uh, experimentally that is the amount of intensity difference squeezing that we get and several other groups working with similar kind of systems get similar amount of uh, intensity difference squeezing so now we can use this intensity difference squeezing for the measurement of the absorption parameter and uh, so the idea would be that you produce this two mode intensity difference squeeze light pass one of the beams through your absorber and again look at the intensity difference fluctuations here so you look at the changes in the intensity difference fluctuations here for different values of absorption that is the this is the measurement which is called the called the quantum advantage so we look at the intensity difference fluctuations using the two mode squeezed light intensity difference fluctuations for the covalent light of the same intensity and this is called the <clears throat> quantum advantage so this is the square root of the intensity difference fluctuations and the quantum advantage uh, that we got using this uh, our squeezed uh, light source for a small values of the absorption is about 1.2 to 1.3 dv okay there are other reports uh, of uh, measurements of the of the quantum advantage and uh, this was an earlier measurement using the spdc sources <clears throat> they had gotten quantum advantage which was like 0.9 db and uh, this is another measurement from ian bomsley's group they are doing a gain measurement stimulated emission and they got a quantum advantage of about 0.25 dv okay so so anyway i mean uh, what i wanted to emphasize the advantages of using quantum light in the in the estimates of the of the parameters and uh, i presented to you the the formal framework for the for the parameter estimates the possible measurement strategies what possible measurements we can do and which have been possible in the past and where one might be headed next we have also lot of ongoing work on uh, nonlinear spectroscopy which involves both uh, billion spectroscopy as well as the stimulated raman microscopy with the uh, squeeze light theoretical work uh, again on covalent nonlinear spectroscopy on the using quantum light and getting better better frequency time resolution and of course the the beautiful experiment uh, from from wineland's group uh, where they used the quantum states of matter so quantum states of matter like uh, like ionic motion okay so i'm happy to have uh, any any further questions uh, thank you very much um if there is any question uh, professor dotto gupta has a question yeah professor would you please go back to the quantum uh, thermometry that slide this slide thermometry 
that you had the master equation you wrote down in, in master equation master equation you wrote in terms of rho yeah so my question is if you do the same thing in a cavity environment let's say a cavity cavity scenario and you add this uh, let's say uh, incoherent pump to this pump, to, to this model so of course you would be ending up with a lesser kind of scenario and what would be the behavior of this quantum fissure information in that case this one yes so you add two things one is the no. cavity you add and you add this incoherent pumping so you are basically a laser scenario isn't yeah. it so in that case this quantum fissure information how would it behave any studies on that or you, you did you look into that well if it's a laser laser system then what do you want to study what not this uh, in this whatever uh, whatever fluctuations in the laser is there can i reduce that fluctuation or not that's the question no no you are not reducing the fluctuations in the laser i mean i mean if you have a laser model the fluctuations are well known so so we cannot uh, cannot reduce the fluctuation the effect of incoherent process like incoherent pumping in this model how does it affect the scenario see incoherent pumping in a sense uh, temperature is like a like a pumping process See, I mean, the whole idea here. I mean, I'm writing this this part of the master equation. That that's for the medium. That you want to look at the properties of the medium, and there are two properties of the medium here: gamma and n t. Yeah. So so this part is telling you what the medium is doing. Whereas in order to get uh, get better estimate of these parameters. i need to come in with a with a input which has quantum characteristics no my so that is the starting, that I, is the important part that you have to come in with input that has a quantum characteristics i understand that uh, ah. was regarding if you add this some incoherent process or incoherent pumping pumping process the how how the results get affected but you see we have not looked at it because because in this context yes that sort of not a relevant, relevant thing to do oh i see okay yeah thanks a lot so i i think there is no more question no you oh, ashok got his own question hello yeah so uh, so uh, regarding that uh, weak absorber uh, estimation alpha yeah um uh, so uh, so since this alpha is not really a passive parameter right it's an active parameter which adds also noise is that finally what bounds your like precision because because yeah, it's absorption I, so there is scattering also yeah yeah absorption you know absorption always adds uh, adds noise and uh, that yeah, certainly limits also little no? so that is why that is why that is why the strategy is best for smaller values of alpha so if you increase uh, alpha then it becomes worse and worse yeah so that's earlier plot you had like that a uh, theoretical plot of with a red dot of the measurement so i mean this one for example here you see as alpha increases it becomes worse and that is purely for scattering from uh, well you see in, in the model when you do theoretical modeling then absorption when we say absorption it includes both uh, scattering losses as well as the transmission losses okay uh -huh. yeah now it's a question of measurement that uh, that you know the when you look at the transmission from the medium the transmission from the medium is determined by both the the absorption in the medium and the scattering from the medium mm -hmm. uh -huh. whereas if you just look at the scattered field that would be determined from the scattering losses 
but uh, but you know we are not looking at the scattered field we are looking at the transmitted field mm -hmm. because scattered field then is very very weak and uh, hard to pick up okay mm -hmm. yeah. but this is this is essentially the the limitation and where you know okay mm -hmm. yeah. okay thank you Uh, so there, if there is no more question, so let us uh, thank our uh, guest speaker, Professor Agarwal. Okay, thanks everybody and great to see everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, bye.